So, have you ever been driving through an American commercial zone and seen the Pink Panther on a billboard for a construction company? Me too. Uh, I was driving across the Midwest recently, and I noticed that in several cities, there were seemingly different construction companies, like hardware stores, uh, and, and like industrial suppliers, all using the beloved Pink Panther as their mascot. Uh, this caught my attention because uh, if you didn't know, um, I have a podcast where I discuss old cartoon, this old cartoon called the Jetsons. Um, anyways, I started asking questions like, uh, is the Pink Panther in the public domain? And um, what does the Pink Panther have to do with construction in the U.S.? Uh, some, of you mis- some of you that are listening to me right now may know the answers to these questions, uh, especially uh, if you have been involved in a class action lawsuit in the last 25 years. Um, but for the rest of you, I'll just share what I found. Um, I was inspired by the detective of the subject matter to begin my own investigation. I basically went down a rabbit hole, and I'm, use- I'm just going to use the cold open for this episode to share what I found. Our story begins at the Warner Brothers Cartoon Studio in Burbank, California, in May of 1963. Warner Brothers had for years been a household name in animation, competing with Disney, MGM, and Hanna-Barbera for the top dog in animation success. MGM had Tom and Jerry, Disney had Mickey and Snow White, Hanna-Barbera had Fred Flintstone and Scooby-Doo, and Warner Brothers had Porky Pig and Michigan Frog. Also, Bugs and Daffy. Um, However, it was this very month of May, 60 years ago, that Warner Brothers decided to close its animation studio. Two prominent animators, not to be discouraged by the closing, and also with the aid of a generous Warner executive, started their own animation production company and started leasing the very studio that they had been working in under Warner. They were director, composer, producer Frizz Freeling, who gave us over 300 Looney, cartoons, Looney Tunes cartoons while at Warner, and executive David H. DePatty, who was, who was the last and uh, longest-lived executive of the original Warner Brothers cartoon studio. Uh, interestingly, DePatty died on September 23rd, 2021, immediately after watching Space Jam, A New Legacy, at his house in Gig Harbor, Washington, at the age of 91. Anyways, uh, Freeling and DePatty decided to call their new animation production company Mirish Jeffrey DePatty Freeling Productions, which is a very Mad Men thing to name your company. This company went on to animate the lightsaber effects in the original Star Wars films. Several former employees uh, also followed Freeling and DePatty, including, uh, notably for this tale, a a layout artist named Holly Pratt, who served as Freeling's right-hand man. Soon after starting, the company was contacted by Hollywood director Blake Edwards, who you may recognize from Breakfast at Tiffany's or Ten, and asked to produce an opening title sequence for the MGM film The Pink Panther, which would release in theaters later that same year. Holly Pratt is credited with creating the character of the Pink Panther seen in this title cartoon. The character was also popular, was so popular, that uh, more cartoons were in high demand. In addition to making the title card for the subsequent films in the series, uh, they made additional cartoons starring the cat, like um, the Pink Fink, like P-I-N-K and then P-H-I-N-K, Pink Fink, which, like, that won the Academy Award for Best Animated Short uh, that next year, in 1964. And actually, this is, like, the only time that a studio's uh, first standalone work won an Oscar. Uh, It's the first and only time that that ever happened. So this thing was popular, right? So the popularity of the cartoon uh, continued to build until... You know, like uh, Beyonce, Knowles, and uh, Steve Martin got involved. But uh, you all know how that went, and I need to get back to the construction topic. Um, One last note here is that the final uh, work that 
Holly Pratt is credited with before his death is uh, Jetsons the Movie. And additionally, Jetsons the Movie is the last theatrical release directed by William Hanna and Joseph Barbera before their deaths. Um, so Jetsons the Movie will also be the subject of my final podcast episode before my death. So uh, just to recap, it's the 1960s, and we have a lovely and stylish Pink Panther cartoon character, thanks to Holly Pratt. And of course, we have a catchy theme, thanks to Henry Mancini. That is, uh, and this, these are building popularity and recognition amongst kids for being in Saturday morning cartoons, and also amongst adults for being the opening act for Peter Sellers, Alan Arkin, and he, or even uh, Ted Wass, Roberto Benigni, ben, Benig, Benigni, ben, Benigni, and uh, yes, uh, Steve Martin. Now our story leaves California and goes back to the Midwest, where this uh, whole thing began. Uh, the name of the town is Toledo, Ohio. Uh, yes. <laughs> Rewind the years to 1935. Two industry giants are heading towards a merger that will change the course of history forever. On one side, you have Owens, Illinois, which is the result of a 1929 merger between the Owens Bottle Company and the Illinois Glass Company. The Owens Bottle Machine Company was started in 1903 by Michael Joseph Owens, who invented the first ever automated bottle making machine. And just out of curiosity, I decided to look up what this thing looked like, and it is insane. Uh, it looked like a carnival ride of death. Anyways, this guy was born on New Year's Day in 1859, and he moved to Toledo in 1888 to work at the Toledo Glass Factory. And he was basically the greatest hire imaginable for factory owner Edward Drummond Libby because this Owens machine lowered the cost of making glass bulbs by 90%. And during this time period, there was some guy in New Jersey who needed to buy about 2001 glass bulbs. So this company in Toledo did gangbusters. Um, eventually, Owens and Libby actually partnered up and started the Owens Bottle Company in 1919, which was rightfully named after Owens. Uh, <laughs> and they did so well that they merged with the Illinois Glass Company, maintaining their headquarters in Toledo, Ohio. Now, on the other side of the 1935 merger, you have a company in that, in my opinion, needs no introduction. Uh, the company was originally founded in 1851 in Somerville, Massachusetts. Yep, that's right. I'm talking about Corning Glass Works from Corning, New York. This company didn't invent glass, but they are the ones who made it cool. And now... I think of this 1935 merger as two giant glass companies coming together to have a baby. But each parent company um, still exists independently because uh, this corporate child would grow up to be uh, very, very different from each of its parents' companies. 
So this kid was named the Owens Corning Fiberglass Company, and it would remain in Toledo, Ohio. Now, fiberglass was new and hot and made this company lots of money. By 1938, it is making more than a trillion in sales of industrial materials and fiberglass products. Uh, actually, um, a, a more than a million in sales <laughs> in uh, industrial materials and fiberglass products. That's a, that's a million with an M as in Mary. Um, fiberglass products, for actually fiberglass production, had been accidentally invented by an employee named Games Slater, which is an amazing name, at Owens, Illinois in 1932, when he directed a jet of compressed air street at a stream of molten glass. So comp- a jet of compressed air directed towards a stream of molten glass, and this produced little glass fibers. And they patented this glass wool in 1933, and this, of course, attracted the attention of Corning and Glassworks, and that led to the merger two years later. So the new company was free to expand and explore the new and excited uses of this fiberglass material. I have a quick aside here about the spelling of fiberglass. Originally, in the 30s, like on the patent, it was spelled with only one S, which is weird. But also in proper English, it's spelled fiberglass, which is even weirder. Now, this company would use fiberglass to reinforce automobile tires, insulate pipelines across Alaska, and to make mats to replace traditional roofing. Basically, as long as you could afford a roof over your head, you were buying something that this company had made. Major, major 3M vibes here. Now, this is where things are going to get better before they get worse, way, way worse. So, in 1955, they decided to start using the roofing material that they were so good at making to create room insulation for houses. In 1957, uh, researchers for Owens Corning at their Newark, Ohio location were testing out different kinds of insulation. In order to distinguish the new insulation they were testing from the old yellow stuff, they decided to use a red dye. And this one decision basically changed everything. The new insulation came out with a bright pink color, not actually serving a material purpose, but the color caught the eyes of the sales team. They decided that the new pink color was what they were going to use, at least temporarily, to show customers that this new insulation was novel and distinguished and different and therefore must be better. They did a Don Draper, and according to Joe Doherty, a former vice president of marketing communication, he said, I don't think we ever realized the power of pink in the marketplace. It was about differentiating with customers. Then we realized we had something different on our hands. It was the color. And you have likely seen pink-colored insulation if you have ever destroyed someone's home with a bulldozer. So they ended up sticking with the pink for the long term because of how effective it was at moving their product. The new pink insulation might not have been 99% pure, but this feels like it's like the real-life equivalent of the color blue in Breaking Bad. Contractors began asking for the pink stuff, and it became an industry standard. In the 70s, they ran a slogan, Put your house in the pink, which is cool. Eventually, in 1985, the company became the first company ever in America to successfully trademark a color. I say successfully because getting this kind of trademark to go through is no simple task. Trademarking a combination of colors is way easier, like McDonald's did with red and yellow. But Owens Corning had to show that the color pink distinguishes the company from its competitors, it doesn't affect the product's cost or quality, and it doesn't serve any functional purpose. They satisfied all those requirements and solidified forever their relationship with the color pink. Now, There's one final step that we need to bring everything together. One final way to elevate the relationship between Owens Corning and the color pink. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. They bought the Pink Panther. In 1980, Owens Corning signed a deal with MGM, who owned the rights to the Pink Panther. The deal would allow the company to use the character and the theme for marketing the company's signature pink insulation. 
In 2020, the company put out a press release celebrating the partnership, saying, The relationship between Owens Corning and the Pink Panther is nothing short of remarkable. For 40 years, the Pink Panther has been a smart and stylish ambassador for our company, speaking per- persuasively to our brand, Promise, despite never uttering a word. Today, contractor, contractors choose pink products five times more often than any other brand. It's difficult to measure the value of pink and the Panther to the company, but, this is, but it is significant, said B.J. Fisher, Director of Strategic Services for FLS Group, a Toledo-based marketing company. So, why did Owens Corning have to buy the Pink Panther? Because he's pink. They had to get everything pink. They are pink. Pink is what they make. and Pink is what they sell. They use the Pink Panther logo on other products that aren't even pink, like roofing shingles. Now, for some sad news, I told you it was going to get worse. I also must report that much like the Pink Panther Diamond, the Owens Corning Company is not without its own flaws. In 1978, two shipyard workers filed a class action lawsuit against, which alleged that Owens Corning and 14 other manufacturers had known about asbestos-containing products. Over the next three decades, it was named in hundreds of thousands of asbestos lawsuits, By 2000, it had settled with 440,000 people who claimed Owens Corning products caused them to develop asbestos-related illnesses such as mesothelioma. On asbestos.com, the Owens Corning fiberglass company has its own subpage um, with one S. And the company had been making asbestos products from basically the 1950s up until 1972 And the asbestos litigation uh, caused the company to file for bankruptcy in 2000. Um, A trust fund containing approximately a billion dollars was established to help compensate the victims. So, at the end of all this, I was left with one final question. I know why the Pink Panther was on the billboards I saw. I know why Owens Corning had to have him. I know that in the movie, the Pink Panther comes from the imperfection in the diamond that... When looking deeply into the stone, looks like a panther leaping. But if the diamond was blue, or green, or orange, then the panther would have not been pink. If the panther was not pink, then Owens Corning would not have to settle, would have had to settle for another pink character as their mascot, like Patrick Starr, Kirby, or Shiv Roy. So why was the diamond pink? Is it because the writers of the movie knew that pink diamonds are the rarest kind of diamond found in the Argyle Diamond Mine of Australia? Is it because the only diamond is is it because this is the only diamond where the source of its color is a mystery and gemologists are actually still debating what causes the pink color? Is it because pink is pretty? Uh, Only Blake Edwards knew the answer to that question, and that's where I'll leave this discussion. Uh, Thank you for joining me on this adventure. Now I'll get to the main part of the episode.
instant replay. Our story begins. Uh, well, I guess the episode that was the first. Um, the episode begins uh, with. Let me restart. The episode begins with George <laughs> standing on a small circular platform, floating in the sky. Um, he's in a quite perilous. He's in quite a perilous uh, situation. Um, nothing appears to be holding this platform in the air, and he's basically stranded and is surrounded by nothing but the endless abyss of space, or the atmosphere, or, um, or just falling. So, his car nearby, his flying car is nearby, and there's smoke billowing out from underneath the car, He's flailing his arms as other flying cars zoom by, and no cars stop to help him or save his life. Uh, they just keep going. So this is alarming to me, because it's not like George is just standing on the side of the road. He's in immediate and mortal danger, thousands of feet in the air, and nobody's even slowing down for his safety. Uh, <laughs> eventually, a flying rocket transit bus uh, pulls up, to his floating piece of debris and picks him up. He just kind of casually steps off the debris onto the bus like Jack Sparrow, paying no mind to the void below. Uh, the driver is like really, really rude and tells him that this isn't one of his regular stops. Uh, this is the point when I wish George had his like sassy side ready and he was like, oh really? I thought you stopped all the time. I wrote that a while ago, and I, um, the driver points out that guys like George mess up his schedule, uh, which is victim blaming. George apologizes and explains that his car broke down and asks how much the bus fare will cost him. The bus driver continues his rude rampage at George. And he tells George that the bus is tokens only. And this little bus kiosk yells at George and basically grows a pair of robot arms and gives him a shakedown. Uh, the kiosk actually takes George's watch uh, from off of his left arm, which is an interesting detail. Um, one reason this is interesting is because this is kind of foreshadowing for the whole episode. And the second reason is that this is proof that even in the future, it will still be time for you uh, to get a watch. So, George gets a seat on the bus next to an elderly gentleman. Uh, this guy has a muted sort of Einstein aesthetic. And he, this man remarks that he saw the ordeal George had just experienced and comments, it's a shame the way they treat you these days. Um... This phrase could basically mean anything at any point in time to anyone. So, it, yeah, I, I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, <laughs> George finally decides that it's time to bring out his Whitney Houston sassy side and says that for him, it has been one of those days. And this is one of my favorite conversations that I've seen in this show so far. Um, I've sort of kept track of these conversations. And, um, anyways, George finds some much needed optimism in the fact that his ordeal is all behind him, uh, and that basically cues the next event in his series of unfortunate events because it's not all behind him. Um, he's suddenly repeatedly bumped in the back of the head by a flying teddy bear wearing nothing but a space helmet. Uh, there is a kid behind George responsible for the astronaut teddy bear beat down. And George politely turns around and says, Please, Sonny, don't do that. Uh, the kid turns to the woman sitting next to him and says, Mommy, Mommy, I hate that man. And as of writing this, I am unable to find words to describe how this makes me feel. Uh, his mother is wearing the signature Jetsons futuristic bonnet cap with curlers in her hair. Uh, his mother basically asks him to stop as to not to ruin his expensive teddy bear. And this comment kind of reminds me of middle school, my middle school woodshop teacher telling us not to chop off our fingers with a bandsaw because the blade is expensive to replace. Um, George is distraught 
and his elderly friend remarks that he used to have those days himself. Um, just as an aside, I decided to refer to this elderly man as George's friend because he's the only person so far in this episode that has not treated George like yesterday's trash. And George is confused by his language and asks how it could be possible for him to not have those days anymore. Um, at this point, Hannah Montana is the only one who knows what they are talking about. This elderly man says that he never has those days anymore because he is an inventor and has invented a solution. Uh, no, it's not what you think it is. He pulls at a device called the Replayola, which is like Crayola, but replay instead of cray. It's a small tablet with a laser attached and four buttons labeled Rewind, Stop, Erase, and Edit. Uh, the elderly man explains that this device allows him to go back and change the bad moments in his life so that they never happened. George does not believe that this is possible, so next the elderly man starts to explain how it works. Now, I will be the first to admit that I do not understand exactly how it works, and... So the man explains that the bus driver was rude to him as well, uh, so he just backed up in life and simply wished that he was as nice as n nice can be. Uh, George points out that this probably op only happened in his mind and that the bus driver did not experience this alternative reality of nicety, which is a level of awareness that surprised me. Uh, the man is like, no, that's actually wrong. This did actually happen, and it wasn't in my mind. The beauty of the replayola is that the change actually is that it actually did change life, and it's not just in his mind; it's in the minds of everyone. So George begins to understand and asks if after something happens, and he says, "I wish I'd said that." He can actually go back and say it. The man confirms and explains that buttons are, the buttons are incredibly sensitive to chemical electroreceptors. Um, I did extensive internet research <laughs> into this phenomena, and I have determined that these buttons are like little sharks. But basically, this is this is what you could do to go back and say the jerk store called, and they're running out of you. So George finally buys into this whole control your life with a remote idea and asks to try it out. He presses the rewind button and then the events of the bus play in reverse with the expensive teddy bear, the shakedown over his watch, and so on until George is once again standing on the floating piece of debris. Uh, he's not phased by this at all, um, just sort of casually reacts to reliving his life in reverse. Uh, not even a flinch or like a cartoon whoa or a sound effect. Um, next, he presses edit and gets on the bus uh, once again. So now the bus driver is speaking in a very nice way. And even though he still says that this is not one of his regular stops, this time he says that he is glad to be in service of George. Uh, the editing that was done was that now the bus driver is feeling a real sense of happiness and fulfillment from carrying out his everyday job which is cool. George apologizes for not having any tokens, and the bus driver says that it's fine, you can mail it into the bus company, which seems like a good system. 
usually I don't make a, de- a big de- too big a deal about how outdated the future of the Jetsons is. I mean, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty and whatever. But mailing in bus tokens is not where I think I want society to be headed in the future. So uh, <laughs> now the robot arms are still kind of patting George, but it's like a good touch from the kiosk. So uh, George sits down and the same kid from earlier, um, you know, is, uh, is behind him. But now he remarks about how nice of a man George is, uh, which is just the opposite of what happened before. So it makes sense within the context of the episode, context of the episode. But I feel like for a kid to do this unprompted is not exactly better than what happened before. It's just different than saying that he hates him. Uh, to take it one step further, um, yes, this can go one step further. Uh, next, the kid says that he wishes George was his daddy. And as of writing this, I am unable to find words to describe how this makes me feel. The elderly man now says, there, now you're right back to the present, which means that he was aware of the changes going on uh, that George was doing. Um, George asks what the erase button does, and the man tells George to be careful. It's for erasing. So George immediately presses erase, and the mother and child behind them are erased forever. They immediately vanish, and George is, like, understandably and reasonably worried about what has happened to them and asks what he just did. Uh, The elderly man tells George not to worry because it's all right. They still exist. They just aren't on the bus. And I honestly laughed out loud when I heard that explanation. (laughs) Um, George says that he has to have this device and asks how much money it will be for him to buy it. The man spares George one and takes a cartoon wad of cash. Um, he spares him a device and George gives him a cartoon wad of cash. Uh, so George next says that he's going to simply erase all the way back to before his car broke down in order to get out of this situation altogether. But the elderly man discourages this because then the replayola will be erased along with the elderly man himself, and George won't have it anymore, which doesn't make sense. I don't know exactly what this means because the only thing I understand is that the erase button makes it so that you are no longer on the bus. Uh, George could have meant rewind everything, but I understand how it's necessary for George's car to break down in order for him to get this device. In the next scene, uh, George arrives back at home. Astro Astro and Elroy are kind of just laying about and not particularly excited to see George return. Same is true for Judy, who's just watching TV. Jane is kind of frantically knitting and checks to see if George got the part for the new sink plunger. Um, Now, from what little I admittedly know about sink plungers, they really only have one part, which is the plunger part. But... um, Orbity is actually stuck on the ceiling uh, inside the toilet plunger and says that George probably forgot. So George kind of just silently looks around for a beat and then pulls out the replayola and rewinds his own revival, arrival. Um, he once again says that he has arrived, but now upon his re-entrance, Astro excitedly greets him. Elroy and Judy follow suit and give him a warm welcome. Even Rosie is now there and refers to George as a wonderful, wonderful employer. George appears to give a release suction fuse to Jane, who somehow uses it to free Orbity from the toilet plunger. So that's, I guess that's the part. Um, and George also notices that the family... Uh, no, Jane, Jane then notices that the family is acting strange, like George has been away for a long time. And George proudly presents the replayola as the greatest thing since laser beam sliced bread. So they were like kind of aware that they had changed, but like, um, so they, it did bring about some questions. So, um, oh, I have a factoid about the, okay. So he, he says it's the greatest thing since laser beam sliced bread. Interestingly, uh, laser beams were only invented 32 years after sliced bread was invented. Um, So George explains how it works. 
saying that he could make himself the star quarterback of their high school football team. He could change anything. And Jane is just like, nah, that's crazy. Bunky Bingston was the star quarterback. Um, and there are some ties here at this particular junction of this episode uh, to these, to the, to the, I don't know if you're aware, but there are some child bride theories surrounding the Jetsons family but I'm not going to comment on them at this time. Uh, George claims that he can actually change the past. So Jane presses him and asks him if he was the quarterback, then what would Bunky be? And George is like, the water boy if I wanted it, which is, um, I think water boy is an Adam Sandler movie. Um, instead of seeing the greatness of the replayola, Jane calls out George's motive for changing the past as an act of jealousy, because Bunky has always been sweet on Jane. And George denies the possibility of being jealous of Bunky and calls Bunky a creep. So Jane counters and says that she saw Bunky at the market, and he's doing very, very well. And I'm not sure why they totally changed the subject based on a hypothetical use case for the device to dig up these old grievances from high school, but they're kind of missing the point of a reality-altering device to talk about you know, Bunky Bingston, but George continues, he carries on and is like, as if Bunky had his net worth printed on his shirt. And I tried to, so while I was writing this, I tried to buy a shirt with my net worth printed on it, but I couldn't because I only found shirts printed uh, with a net worth of not equal to self-worth. But Bunky is living in their, um, in the, in the neighborhood now, He's in, he's in their neighborhood, but he's at the expensive Snooty Towers, which sounds nice. Uh, that reminds George that he has to go to a neighborhood meeting and speak about improvements. Uh, George has admitted in the past that he is an awful speaker, public speaker, but now with the replayola, he is confident in his speaking abilities. I looked into neighborhood meetings for this one because I honestly haven't gotten much substance from this episode. Uh, (laughs) And I found some steps for organizing your own neighborhood meeting. Uh, This might be useful for you. Uh, In case you are interested in improving your community, the city of Longmont, Colorado, uh, shout out LPC, recommends that you, uh, one, volunteer to to be a neighborhood organizer, Uh, two, call a meeting of your core group, Three, call a meeting and invite all your neighbors. Uh, Four, facilitate the neighborhood meeting. Five, continue to hold regular meetings. And six, uh, have a celebration. In the next scene, George is butchering his neighborhood speech. He's nervously pausing and stuttering his way through something about protecting the appearance of the neighborhood. George uh, is done and they welcome... And next, they welcome a new speaker, a new neighbor to speak. And you guessed it, it's Bunky Bingston. Uh, Bunky starts going, uh, speaking. He basically writes right away, is insulting George, calling him silver-tongued and all that. Um, He says George still has all his marbles, but he keeps them in his mouth. You know, like, he starts a lecture about the word neighbor he, he says that to him, it means respect, concern, care, and neighbor even means love. Uh, and George is not just going to sit in the audience and take any of this crap. So he starts pressing buttons on his remote and Bunky like immediately nervously starts stuttering as a result of George editing. And Bunky pulls out notes to try and correct course, but it's just a police squad style to-do list with laundry and groceries. Uh, Jane sees through what's going on and calls George out, but he continues to change reality and redoes his speech like Anthony and decisively wins over the crowd. By the end, he's giving off the Mr. Rogers neighborhood energy and Jane is impressed with George, but Bunky is humiliated.
after the meeting, uh, George is approached by a man named Ralph Kingmaker. He has a cigar, and he introduces himself as a political tactician, having seen the value of George's rousing speech. Uh, George is called by Ralph the most exciting new political personality of their time. He tells George that he could be a senator, or maybe even governor, or maybe even go all the way. I looked this up, and 17 senators have become president, and 17 governors have become president. And a couple senators have become governor and also president. And I'll let you do your own research to figure out which uh, senators did that. Um, I won't do all the work. Uh, (laughs) In the next scene, Jane and George are Christmas shopping, and... George uses the replayola to go back to his last bank deposit and increase it by several hundred dollars. Uh, Jane tells him that he's basically cheating, but George shrugs it off by saying that he will just replay the last time Spacely denied him a raise and change the past. Um, I have a note to maybe discuss the movie Click here. I don't know what that means. Um... George is allowed to rewrite history to whatever is convenient for him. Uh, He has physically realized a reality that is made up of things that are and always have been how he wants to remember them. It's amazing. His next move is to take over the stock market. So he goes to E.F. Glutton Stockbrokers, which has the slogan of pigs out on... No, sorry. The slogan is... Pig out on stocks with Glutton. He speaks with a stockbroker robot who is recommending for him not to buy amalgamated steel and dye stocks because they have a terrible profit dividend ratio. Of course, Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers has a labor union that has something to do with the Pittsburgh and Star Trek. Um, also, my interpretation of the terrible profit dividend ratio is that the company is making decent profit, but the shareholders somehow are not seeing that profit pay out for them in dividends. I study the market. George picks up 20,000 shares and the money is due in three days. I'm guessing that he bought them at a low price because of the poor rating of the stock. So the price he is paying for the stock is locked in at the current value and he just owes the money three days from now. Next, a newsie exclaims that the main plant of amalgamated steel and dye, spelled D-I-E, has blown up, and the executives are in prison for embezzlement and fraud. I think that checks out, based, of course, on the terrible profit-dividend ratio that we know about. When the stock dives 80 points, George simply changes the past, and the company has its greatest year in history, and he nets half a million dollars. One point is equal to one dollar, so it's 20,000 shares um, divvying by 80 uh, points would be a loss. Diving by 80 points would have been a loss um, of 1.6 million dollars, if you do the math. Um, (laughs) George is standing in front of a mirror getting ready for a big event in the next scene. Uh, He's wearing a fancy suit and quoting JFK, saying that, Some men are born great, and some men have greatness thrust upon them. Uh, George adds that some men are a combination of the two. George, at this point, possesses the ability to rewrite history and force greatness to be thrust upon him, or even make himself to be born great. He could also have stopped uh, JFK's assassination. He is going to speak at an important fundraiser next, with 5,000 people listening. Judy and Elroy are questioning his decision to do more public speaking because they still know him as a bad public speaker. They were not present at the neighborhood meeting, so they have not seen his newfound speaking skills in action. Judy reminds George that the time that he spoke at her Girl Scout meeting, the girls almost cookied him to death. Uh, researcher, I, oh, I have a note here to research, I didn't do this, uh, I was going to research deaths that have occurred at Girl Scout meetings, but I did not do that. Um, Jane is wearing a new dress, uh, doing her best Abigail Lincoln impression to match George's Abraham Lincoln impression as he starts quoting the Gettysburg Address. He replaces the forefathers with astronauts in the land with galaxy. 
Uh, Rosie even tells him to break a leg, which he has never heard before and does not understand as an expression. Uh, Rosie has to apologize for using ancient showbiz talk, which is the first time in the show that a character has acknowledged the ancient anachronisms in speech patterns. Jane is concerned with wearing the appropriate attire of a governor's wife or a senator's wife or an all the ways wife. Elroy and Judy still lack faith in their father's public speaking ability, and Elroy closes out the scene with a roast of his dad, commenting that Jane should focus more on what a widow would wear when they bury their husband, 7 out of 10. George and company arrive at the fundraiser and meet Ralph Kingmaker and his wife. Jane and Mrs. Kingmaker are wearing an identical dress, which is an immediate point of contention. A fracas breaks out between the two parties, and George sees his potential future as a politician slip away. Some interesting jabs are exchanged, including Judy coming to the defense of Elroy, but ultimately George decides to fix things with the replayola. The only problem is that it isn't in his pocket where he thought it was, and he can't find it, and the chaos rattles on for a bit longer. Eventually, Bunky Bingston enters the scene and asks if anyone has lost a device, which he's holding up, and of course, it is what else but the replayola. George is actually glad to see Binky for, for once, and uh, because Binky Bungston successfully recovered the device, but Binky Bungston just repeats an insult from earlier. Uh, George, in the end, successfully recovers the device from Bunky and deploys it to redo the entire exchange with the Kingmakers. Now, Jane and Mrs. Kingmaker are delighted to share great taste in fashion, and George can proceed to his speech. Um, George ex executes a perfect speech uh, at the meeting about accomplishing the goals of tomorrow or whatever. After his speech, the family has returned home, and George gets an update from Glutton Stockbroker. The amalgamated steel stock has risen by half a billion points, and George Jetson is now a billionaire with plans to become president and win all the planets in the galaxy. Um, I guess it's like a one-by-one one thing. Uh, George is ranting to Jane about how he has everything now, all the money and power he could want. He is talking about how Bunky is nothing compared to him. Jane still maintains that George is jealous of Bunky and calls out George for using the replayola to get ahead, which Bunky doesn't have. George does not care and still claims that Bunky is a bum no matter what. Jane messes with George and plays with the idea of Bunky being a better kisser than him. George is disgusted by that conversation and out of jealousy, decides to erase the whole day that Bunky and Jane kissed.
So when George erases the day that Bunky and Jane kissed, he's immediately transported to a reality where Rosie is cooking toast in their kitchen. Um, he's in this, his house, but it's like different, right? The toast is burnt again, um, and the toaster is using arms to scrape off the burnt parts of the toast. But uh, George, you know, uh, starts walking around and looking for his family members in this like bizarro Jetsons world, but nobody's here. And he's also figures out that he's unmarried. Um, he puts two and two and two and two and two and two and two together and realizes that Bunky kissed Jane at his own wedding when Jane was his bride. Uh, so George unintentionally erased his entire wedding day. Um, no, his family still exists at this point. They are just no longer on the bus. George tries to explain to Rosie the nature of what just happened to him, but Rosie interprets George's actions as madness. Uh, Rosie, the sentient robot, goes over to the phone book and looks for a doctor under bonkers. George vows to sue the man on the bus in the biggest lawsuit that has ever been. Rosie tries to see if they can work George in at the Happy Dale home for the hopelessly zonked. George receives another update from Glutton, the stockbroker, that the amalgamated steel stock is up another half a billion, and George is almost the richest and most powerful man in the universe. George won't hear it, and is committed to find Jane and the kids. His only idea is to find Bunky Bingston. Even Kingmaker tries to talk to George, but George ignores him. George goes to Snooty Tower and finds Bunky's place. Jane answers the door, and George learns that Jane and Bunky are married, and neither one of them has seen him in the last 20 years. George tries to get Jane to leave with him, but they kick him out like Biff in Back to the Future. George has his outdoor rainy thunder exterior sad scene for this season and sulks outside. George realizes that he only has one possibility left, which is to rewind to the bus and see if the inventor can help him. He does this, and the inventor's only solution is to take the replayola from George and use it to have taken a different bus. This works, and George is now back exactly where he started, on the bus, except now the kid uses his mother per mother's purse to hit George because the bear isn't heavy enough. This possibility suggests that the kid is aware that George erased him and is enacting revenge. The kid even specifies that now he really hates George. <laughs> George doesn't care about anything but getting back to see his family. George arrives home and receives the same initial greeting as before and is nonetheless very happy to be home. The neighborhood meeting is now canceled and Orbity is no longer there, so the family stays in for dinner. George suggests ordering space pizza, but Jane has invited Bunky over for dinner. George remarks that he has to keep li reliving this, and then the episode ends. So... That's that's where we leave the Jetsons. I have a post. Um, one last thing to read for this episode. Um, this was posted by Artman2003 on the internet on Saturday, January 21st, 2006. Um, this this post is related to this episode, so I, I thought I'd share it as a, as a final closing piece for, for this episode, and thank you for listening to, to me talk about this. Um, all right, here we go. What if you had a control Z in real life? What if you could undo things you've done if you screw up or things don't go as planned? Then the replayola device is just what you're looking for. The replayola can allow the possessor to rewind, modify, or completely release, erase any point in time. Did you just rear-end somebody on the highway? If you have the replayola, you can just rewind time and avoid doing that the second time or just erase the event completely. Did you have a bad job interview? Did the potential new boss just not like you? Using the replayola, you could have a second chance to make that first impression. The second time around, he'll be crazy about you. The replayola device appeared in an episode of The Jetsons entitled Instant Replay. It originally aired on March 9, 1985. The episode begins with George Jetson having one of the worst days of his life. His car breaks down and he has to ride the bus. He has no tokens, so the driver takes his watch instead. 
He sits in front of an irritating boy who yells, I hate this man. George encounters a genius inventor, voiced by Greg Berg, who gives him a replayola. With this device, the bus driver allows George to mail his tokens in, and the boy is suddenly nice. Enamored with the replayola, George begins using it to fix all kinds of problems, and his worst day becomes his best. That is, until an old flame of his wife, Jane, pays a visit to Orbit City. This man kissed Jane first, before George, which has always caused George much acrimony towards him. In his boldest replayola move yet, George decides to redo that kissing event. No, erase that whole day. But George forgot that that was the day of his wedding to Jane. George suddenly finds himself in a life where he is rich and successful, but he does not have the things he'd held most dear. His beloved wife and kids, Elroy and Judy. Even though he's rich and powerful, George is suddenly miserable. In the end, George ends up using the replayola to modify time, so he never had it. After that, the kid on the bus really hates him, and his day is even worse than it originally was, but getting his family back was well worth it. I think that, for a kid's show, this episode of The Jetsons tackles a lot of adult moral and philosophical issues. If you had a real replayola, what would you do with it? I think it is a very smart episode, one of the best of the entire series. It explores the possibilities, neck good, good and um, possibly disastrous, of using a device that modifies or erases time. Like the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Tapestry, changing one little thread in your life could unravel the whole thing. One little slip up with the replayola could completely change your life in unintended ways. Or you could ruin someone else's. Would bettering your own life be worth that? I think this episode teaches, above all else, that mucking around in time is probably not a good idea. Thank you for listening, and have a good night. See so